everybody. Welcome back to the Consummate Athlete Podcast. It's another snowy day in Collingwood, Ontario, so you'd think I was recording this episode in January, but really, it's April. I'm Molly Herford. I write about, talk about, and now practice uh, all different types of outdoor and now indoor activities from spin class to yoga in this week and plenty of trail running and riding outside when when it's possible. Although right now it seems like it's never going to be possible again. Yeah, and I'm Peter Glassford. I'm a registered kinesiologist. I don't want to talk about the weather at the moment. He's having a mood today. Yeah. <laughs> it's just... It's, it's been a tough one, for sure. Uh, we had a brief respite where spring was almost here, and now we're back kind of under the snow. Um, wasn't as bad for me, I don't think, this weekend, because I'm still going through yoga teacher training. So actually, nice weather on weekends, I think, makes me crazier than when the weather sucks, because if it's nice out, I can see out the window and see people jogging by the studio and playing outside, and I get super jealous of that, so... A little bit of rain on Saturdays and Sundays in Toronto is sort of ideal for me, to be totally honest. Um, we did inversions this weekend. I am getting much better at my handstands. Peter had to yell at me when we got home last night because I kept kicking up against the wall maybe a little more enthusiastically than I should have at 10 p.m. Um, yeah, and otherwise, I let's see. I'm just I'm going to go with me here. I taught two spin classes this week. It was very exciting, very nerve-wracking. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, they went okay. I explained to the class while huffing and puffing up a fake hill that uh, playing Born to Run would have gotten a really good reaction in New Jersey, but it turns out playing the boss in Ontario does not really <laughs> get quite the same excitement that I was hoping for. No, you'd have to do like Tragically Hip or yeah, something. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Well, I know for next time. Uh, yeah, it was it was a pretty good week, I'd say. Pretty so did busy. you have any moments, you know, you're talking inversions, so this is handstands or headstands or shoulder stands, just really going upside down. Did you have sort of practical takeaways? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think the biggest thing that's super easy to forget when you're up in a handstand or like after you've kicked up to the wall, uh, sort of the way you get off the wall is, uh, and it sounds so cheesy when you say it, but knitting your ribs together and just bringing them down, so really engaging your core, engaging that pelvic floor, all that stuff, sort of slightly internally rotating your thighs uh, in and really squeezing them. Um, I think people get really caught up in the balancing in a handstand. So you're like trying to do this corrective thing where you kind of sway a tiny bit one side or the other or forward and back and stuff and everything gets a little lax. But really, if you just tighten up that's where the stability actually comes from in the pose so that's that's what i learned mm -hmm. yeah it was good uh today's guest has nothing to do with handstands and everything to do with ultra trail running though uh sarah cotton is this awesome runner for under armor she raced track in college and then just decided to do an ultra run on a whim killed it and now that's her profession she's also a really good artist um we chat kind of all about all things trail running. Uh, this is actually the podcast. We recorded this probably a few weeks ago now, and it got me starting to think about uh, Under Armour's Ultra Trail Running Mountain Run series uh, that has a 50K in Killington, Vermont at the end of August. And I, you can hear me start to ponder it in the show. And I will say, as of like a week ago, I'm actually registered for it. So I guess I actually need to start really focusing on my training for an ultra trail run. And that's the week after the Ellen Noble quest that we're part of. Oh, excellent point. So if you are or or have interest in or possession, is it possession? You are not a possession. Like, no. They're young enough that you sort of have possession. No. But if, if you're the parent if or, or the caregiver of a, a, what's our age group on this? Uh, 15 to 18. 15 to 18, you know, aspiring cyclocrosser, you know, pretty interested in cyclocross. I don't think registration's up, but you can check out, is it ellennoble.com? Yeah, ellennoble.com backslash quest. It's a five-day cyclocross camp in Western Mass. We're going to be there. It's going to be awesome. There's going to be some yoga and some running training with me. Peter's going to be helping with all the bike skills stuff. And I mean, 
it, most of you listening to this podcast would have heard us talk about Ellen Noble before. Silver medalist at Worlds and Cross. Amazing racer, amazing human, one of my favorite people on earth. Uh, so it's going to be a really fun week. So if you have a young girl that, you know, is really stoked on racing, this might be a really good <laughs> good choice for her ahead of cross season. So check that out for sure. What else have we got going on? People are starting to race. Well, yeah, they tried. Yeah, I mean, the <laughs> California races are going and stuff, so it's definitely... I think my my down mood today is a combination of weather and then also I've been training quite hard here. I'm in the... the I'm fond of the bus bench, park bench analogy, so... We've gone through the park bench, just sort of getting the workouts done for the last few months, getting healthy again. And now we're into that sort of that harder time where we're going a little deeper. And I almost fell over on the indoor trainer yesterday. So pretty excited about the race season. So I think that's that's tough. And then also having lots of athletes starting their season. So there's lots of nerves and stuff like that. So we're doing lots of polishing off on training plans, you know, people starting new training plans, you know, building towards the summer, and then also just phone consults here as we get sort of those last minute jitters or last minute adjustments to sort of the plan and the routine as those big races approach in May and June. Yeah. On that note, if you're a cyclist or a runner or any kind of racer endurance wise that doesn't have a training plan, but is planning on racing now might be the time to jump into a training plan. Uh, so smartathlete.ca for some details on that, or you could even just go with the consult and kind of get a better sense of what your schedule should look like as race day starts approaching. That was a really explicit sales pitch. I was just going to drop it in there sort of implicitly, but that's, well, that's awesome. Yeah, I've got your back, honey. Yeah. And I, <laughs> and I mean, worst case, you can listen to, you know, podcasts episodes like this very one here if you happen to be building like molly is towards this vermont race in august it's it's getting to that time cough cough or read saddle sir and fuel your ride we're just just throwing the pitches i don't think either of those are going to be super helpful no, I mean, for cycling though if your bike racing is coming up fuel your ride is an excellent read for I that that's true i don't think it's related to you running 50 kilometers no off road, but... no very little is really <laughs> related to that right now that's my big scary goal for summer mm-hmm um, and you were having some knee pain this past two yeah. weeks. You had some, I would call it yoga overuse. Yeah. That's how I diagnose that. A little too much of the uh, sitting cross-legged on the ground for eight hours a day for two days a week. So really trying to address that and slowly get back to running in good form. Mm-hmm. And so we hit that with a little bit of foam rolling, for lack of a better term, some mobilization. If you listen to our last Q&A, there was a question about why we're still foam rolling so we did hit that with a little bit of sort of self-massage or myofascial release um we hit it with some placebo kin tape uh, and then also you also just got back moving again right and that was we sort of diagnosed it as you were sort of sitting you know with those knees under sort of load cross-legged and then also just for a long time right like the the yoga teacher training i think is almost like a a training in like posture and or lack thereof yeah Yeah, just an endurance like attrition they just want you to quit at some point so and just sort of sit on a mat i was telling peter the first day everyone's pretty keen and like sitting you know the first day classes started everyone yeah very keen sitting you know ramrod straight on our yoga mats like maybe a bolster but that wasn't till like five hours in and by five weeks in now like the whole entire room is completely empty because we're all just backed up against the wall like lounging against the wall Um, which, you know, at a glance seems really kind of like we're quitting and giving up, but really it's just impossible to sit like that, I think, for eight hours unless you're very trained in that. Your best posture is your next posture. Boom. So we're talking ultra running today. Yeah. So people can extend out the length they're running, or if you're just curious about a a slower-paced running, you know, you've never done any running, I guess you could be looking at ultra running. Any kind of trail stuff, uh, I'd recommend listening to this, because we talk a ton about how to get uphill and downhill without hurting yourself and kind of at your most efficient. It's funny, a lot of people don't think about off-road running, but it's it's a completely different sport. Oh, Uh, it's so good. Yeah, I've never been fond of road running. I stomached it for Ironman last year, but if you haven't tried off-road running, A, it tends to be easier, at least in the the overuse side of things for injuries 
Um, but also there's a lot more to look at and varied terrain. And if you've been into cycling, it, you know, especially off-road cycling, it's going to be a little more appealing than just running down a flat paved road. Exactly. So let's okay. dive in and see if you like ultra running. First thing we always ask everybody to do is just kind of give a little, you know, 30 second elevator pitch bio of themselves. So Sarah, who are you? <laughs> <laughs> well, my name is Sarah Cotton. Um, I am 23 years old, currently living in Flagstaff, Arizona. Um, I actually grew up in Connecticut, so quite different. Um, and then, you know, went to high school there and then went out to Washington, D.C. to go to college. Um, I went to Georgetown University and ran track and field there, um, studied art, and yeah, pretty much ended up moving to Flagstaff, like, right after I graduated, um, which I guess wasn't that long ago, not even a year. Yeah, um, <laughs> and so I've been here since then. Okay. So track and yeah. field into ultra trail running. Uh, that's a fairly yeah. substantial shift. How did that happen? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it is, um, yeah, it's definitely a big shift. And not really one that most people do so soon after college um if you know if you ran track and field in college Mm -hmm. so yeah I guess I I always did like long distance events in college um which you know at that level is like the longest you're going to do as a 10k um and but yeah our coach was always pretty into like high mileage which I really kind of thrived off of and I always loved like the long workouts and the long runs and stuff Mm -hmm. um so I kind of knew that was like my my bread and butter um and yeah long story short one of my friends who I really had never even spent that much time with but we met each other like once and kind of bonded over running and trail running and stuff and she kind of hit me up when I was about to graduate and was like, Hey, do you want to do this trail race with me (laughs) out in Oregon? And I was like, sure, why not? Um, and so, yeah, I did that in, I graduated in May and then did that race in July. Um, and it went really well and I loved it. And so I kind of decided that that was what I wanted to focus on. Okay. How did you train for that first race? So you already have the speed did you add just a ton of volume yeah. before that, or what did you do? Yeah, so luckily, like I said, in college, we were always a pretty high-volume team. Um, so, you know, I would do I, – I was pretty prone to injuries, so I would do a lot of, like, cross-training as well, um, mm-hmm. which really just is going to build your endurance. So, it you know, it helps when it comes to ultra running. Um, so yeah, I guess I just kind of tried to build up my long runs and it's not like I had that much, like, it's not like I had like a year to really switch my training around. I had like basically a few weeks. Um, so I got in, got in some, you know, some longer, like two and a half to three hour runs on the weekends. Um, and kind of just kept up the volume. Um, wasn't really doing like crazy workouts or anything, but I was definitely like very underprepared going into the race. (laughs) Um, but yeah, I'd say, I'd say the one thing that I did was kind of step up my, my long run game. Mm -hmm. And what about just the switch to trails too? Yeah, that, um, it, luckily the race wasn't like super technical or anything like that. Um, you know, it was all on trail, but it wasn't like I was like climbing over boulders or anything that I like wasn't used to. Mm -hmm. Um, and I mean, we we actually surprisingly had a pretty good trail system in D.C. um, that I would run on a lot. And I had spent some summers out in Flagstaff when I was in college. um, And the trail running out here is just unbelievable. So, yeah, I kind of had, like, little hints of doing, like, more mountainous running and stuff. And, it yeah, it just kind of came, I guess, kind of came naturally. Um, I'd grown up running on trails a lot. So... Yeah, but okay. it's definitely in a racing a racing mindset is very different than throwing on spikes and racing on a track. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, and so you said you were you were prone to injury. Have you found that trail and like longer distance has been kinder to your body, or was the shorter, harder stuff better for you? 
No, I really have found that the longer and like less intensity kind of running has been a lot better for me. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the like n- you know naturally I just don't really have those like fast twitch muscles that you need um, when you're racing on the track, mm-hmm. and so that was always kind of a struggle for me to like get that back when I needed it. Um, mm-hmm. And so I think the the longer you know can still run quickly but generally slower stuff has just been it's more it feels more natural for me um Mm -hmm. and of course running on softer surfaces all the time is like incredibly helpful Mm -hmm. so yeah and it's definitely been kinder to my body yeah I can I can definitely say that I can feel even just now like our trails are finally uh, melted enough that I can run on them again and yeah like suddenly all of like the little like niggling like you know, pains in my foot from running on the road and stuff are just gone after like a couple runs on the soft surface again. Totally. Yeah. It's, it's amazing. Um, and you know, I mean, when you're running, when you are running on trails, it kind of forces you to, forces you to slow down a bit. Um, Mm -hmm. you're using like, you know, more dynamic muscles and stuff. So it's, yeah, I think it's been good. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so you're also an artist in addition to be, oh, actually, so I'm going to go back to this. So somehow though, you (laughs) did this first run in June and now you're a professional with Under Armour. How did that happen? (laughs) Yeah. Um, you know, I feel, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm very lucky to be in this position right now. Um, and I mean, I think I, you know, I had pretty good success in college despite um despite injuries and stuff and you know I was on one of the best collegiate programs in the country Mm -hmm. um and so I think that gave me a little you know a little bit more background than just having jumped into one race Mm -hmm. um but yeah I mean Under Armour they're, they're like they're really trying to grow their trail program and um you know I think they kind of recognize that I'm a capable runner who's also very um very intent on pursuing the trails and succeeding on the trails Mm -hmm. um and they're also awesome about like supporting people who are you know more than just a runner um and so you know I do a little bit of photography for them too um Mm -hmm. and videography stuff so yeah just kind of an all-around sponsorship I guess that's awesome, and that actually leads very nicely into the how does the art and photo stuff play into your running, and does one inform the other? I, I know for me, I get a lot of my best story ideas and stuff when I'm out doing longer runs. Yeah, it's um, it's a cool mix for sure, and you know, the the bulk of my work, my photo and video work, is with runners. Um, so it's cool to it's cool to work with people from all different backgrounds and who are pursuing all different types of running. Um, and yeah, like I went to New Zealand recently to do some photography for some of Under Armour's athletes who were running a race out there. So it's like it's kind of a weird thing. Like I'll sometimes I'm on one side of the camera and then other times I'm on the other side of the camera. Like I also just did a photo shoot and was like. A model for Under Armour so it's pretty weird like it definitely flip flops but it's a cool it's like cool to have that insight mm-hmm. um, on I guess both sides of the lens I was going to say do the photographers love you because you're like a little bit more aware of what they're trying to do um yeah like I'd say it's definitely it makes things easier like in this photo shoot recently it was just it's kind of cool like I was able to talk to the photographer about like his camera and like what you know I just I feel like I can sense like his vision kind of maybe mm-hmm. more so than I would be able to if I had never been in his shoes mm-hmm. um so and the, it's also super helpful when I'm trying to photograph runners or take videos of runners and I you know I know what looks normal and like what doesn't look natural um so I think that it it helps both ways that's a really good point yeah because you can definitely tell when you look at some kind of like cheesier running photography stuff you can see like when someone's doing that like fake running motion as they're going 
So both. Totally, <laughs> totally. Yeah. And I feel like I'm almost heard like horror stories of like runners at photo shoots and they're just like, Yeah, they're like making me do the weirdest things and like I would never do that normally. Like yep. you know, I'm not gonna like jump off this bench in the middle of a run or something and so yeah, it's it's definitely good to know what looks natural. That's awesome. Um Okay, so you finished your first ultra race. What were you thinking when you crossed the finish line? Was it just like, oh my God, I want to do this over and over again? Or, oh my God, I never, ever, ever want to do this again until like the next day? Um, No, it was really, I mean, yeah, I took it, you know, pretty conservatively. And like, I really just had no, no clue what I was like getting myself into. Um, I had never run longer than like, 18 miles um and this race was 31 miles oh. so you know that last yeah so that last like 10 or so miles was just absolutely like unknown territory to me um and I think you know it was really difficult um definitely different than you know racing cross country or racing on the track but really rewarding also in its own way mm-hmm. um and so yeah I guess crossing the the finish line like it was exciting to know that I could compete at longer distances than I ever had um and just you know be out there racing for such a long amount of time compared to what I had been used to Mm -hmm. um and it was also just a super super cool environment like uh the runners are just like so supportive and the race directors and it's just a really a really cool kind of uplifting environment um which is you know, not always what collegiate running is like. So I think that was exciting for me too. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's kind of similar almost. um, We're we're more of like a cycling background, or at least that's mine. Um, And I'd say to me, like trail running is like mountain biking and road running is like road racing. And yeah, road racing, you know, whether it was on foot or on the bike has a very kind of like diff quality to it in terms of the competitors and the fans and like the atmosphere and then mountain biking and trail running are a little more party hard kind of things that I really love (laughs) totally (laughs) yeah yeah it's a totally different feel and yeah I like I feel like professional track and like professional road cycling has a lot more money in it too so it's yeah you know it's got that pressure um and it's cool that I feel like I'm both mountain biking and trail running is growing mm-hmm. uh so hopefully it can hold on to its kind of grassroots feel exactly yeah I think it will I mean you know you're in the middle of yeah. the woods it can't really get how how much more pro <laughs> can it get like totally totally okay so ultra running especially on the trails I feel like is the most gear running kind of or gear heavy form of running that someone can do. So talk to me about what you need gear wise for a race. Yeah. Um, you know, it really totally depends on the race. So, Mm -hmm. um, I feel like a lot of 50 days are, you know, you really don't need a whole lot. Like you're going to need a good pair of shoes for sure. Um, and if you want to wear a vest, you're going to want a nutrition vest, but if not, um, you can also just carry, you know, carry water bottles, um, carry whatever nutrition you need, like in your shorts or wherever you want to put it. Mm -hmm. Um, like some people wear belts and stuff. Um, and there are aid stations. So it's really, yeah, it really kind of depends. Like there are some, you know, crazier races that are, a lot harder on your body that actually uh require you to wear certain things Mm -hmm. um so like um you know they require that you do have a nutrition vest and you have like an extra coat or a buff or whatever it might be um but yeah i'd say the biggest things are knowing that you have a pair of shoes that you're going to be comfortable in for that long um and then i guess just in training kind of getting used to like how you want to carry your nutrition Mm -hmm. um because i mean no matter who you are you're going to need nutrition out there um so yeah it's kind of just getting you know you really have to like know what works best for you and what's most comfortable for you um but yeah i think you see a lot of i mean i'll say i did this uh when i did one trail marathon and that was uh put on a new uh running pack 
the morning of the race. Uh, definitely chafed okay. a little yeah. bit. It was not great. So, yeah, the amount of, I think, people that try new stuff on race day is pretty high. Oh, not a good idea. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> never yeah, never a good idea. Through... <laughs> no, no. I've definitely gone through, like, multiple packs finding out which one works best for me because – I mean, you know, everyone's shaped differently. So a couple of them, sh- like, chafed me really badly, and then others, like, fit like a glove. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, like I said, I think it's definitely just a matter of practicing um, on your long runs and stuff and really just getting to know what works best for you. Yeah. So since you've started trail running, what's, like, your favorite piece of gear that you've gotten? Um, I, let's see. I've actually been using a Nathan pack recently. It's the like Vapor House, okay. um, which I've yeah, which I've really loved. Um, I don't love running with bottles in my hands. I kind of prefer to have a vest, mm-hmm. which is kind of weird to some people. But um, yeah, the Vapor House, like you can put a bladder in it, and it's super light and like doesn't chase me at all. So that's kind of been my my go to. Um, my go-to piece of gear, I would say. Okay, nice. I have, like, one running pack that I've ever found that I like, and I admit I actually threw out the bladder because I mainly use it for grocery shopping. Oh like, I'll run to the store oh and, like, gosh. get a couple things. So I look like... The, oh, that's so funny. I look like such a dork, but it works. <laughs> what do you use? So one of these days I'll have to get that because I'm, I'm with you. I hate running with one in my hand. It just drives me crazy. Yeah. And I mean, you know, totally, you fall, totally. and now you've got water everywhere. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, you, like, scratch up your hands, and you're just like, uh, that's, yeah. I don't know why. It just feels distracting for me to carry them. Yes, definitely. Um, so on the topic of crashing, I have to ask, any any big crashes for you on trails? Um, I've had a few. Luckily, I did not crash in that race. Um, I saw a lot of crashes happen in front of me. Um, but yeah, I, I've had some bad ones in flag for sure. Um, there's, you know, kind of some gnarly trails out here that I've just, I think the worst of them have been running downhill and you just kind of face plant and there's like nothing you can do about it. Um, and next thing you know, you've, you've rolled like 20 feet down the hill um so yeah I've definitely had some nasty ones but luckily never during a race um which yeah I'm sure I'll experience at some point but it definitely kind of shakes you up so I -hmm. feel like it's something that is probably good to experience in training because it's definitely likely that it's going to happen in races yeah I generally go with like my rule of if I'm on the trail and I crash once that's a normal trail run if I've crashed twice it's time to start heading home no matter how like, yeah. long or short I've been out <laughs> like, yeah that's exactly warning you're like, signs <laughs> yeah you're like okay I'm probably too tired to be doing this <laughs> yeah exactly uh, that's funny. I actually yeah. have a how any tips for downhill on my on my list of things I wanted to ask because I feel like going downhill is actually in a lot of ways more important than the uphill when it comes to running racing. So, yeah, any, yeah. any advice? Yeah, um, you know that's still something that I'm actually really trying to work on. Um, I mean, it's like you see some people run downhill and it's just absolutely incredible. Like they just fly. Um, mm-hmm. And I even remember, like, in high school, I raced this cross-country race and, like, was up in the front and, like, all these girls passed me going downhill. And I was like, oh, my God, I need to work on this. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's definitely been, like, a a long time coming that I need to practice it more. But I'd say, like, the biggest thing for me is really just try – you really just have to kind of, like, let go. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, I think the only reason to, like – run slow downhill is probably because you're afraid of falling or tripping or something um and so if you can kind of just let your inhibitions go and just kind of flow Mm -hmm. then I think that's like the best definitely the best piece of advice I can give um and you know it's like I've run with some people who are really good at downhill running so I'm like okay I need to keep up and you know I'll try to just kind of let go and just you know I don't know I mean, you have to look at the ground, but also just kind of feel it out and just really, like, I don't know, just kind of go with it. And Mm -hmm. it's a really hard thing to learn, but it's definitely worth practicing. 
Yeah, every once in a while you can get into that like flow state kind of thing and it's just perfect. But yeah, as soon yeah. as you start thinking about like, oh my God, what if I, what if I crash? What if I hit this rock? Oh God, the rock. <laughs> it's, it's all over. Totally, yeah. <laughs> yeah, oh, for sure. Like, I mean, I've done some runs and just, and basically walking downhill and I'm like, what the hell am I doing? Yeah, like, what is I, wrong with I, me? I should definitely be able to run this. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's, it's definitely a matter of just kind of letting go. Yeah. Okay. And then on the flip side, what about going uphill? Because again, I mean, for trail running racing, it's so much of it is up, down, up, down, up, down. Yeah. Um, yeah. So luckily on the other side of things, I've, I've always been pretty good at uphill running. Um, and I think, yeah, I think it's just a matter of like, Oh man. So, I mean, when I started running like a lot more mountainous stuff up in Flagstaff, you know, we're up at like a pretty much a minimum of 7,000 feet when you're doing like trail runs. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think the biggest thing that I noticed was like just your heart rate elevating a ton. Mm -hmm. Um, and I feel like you can almost start to like panic because you're like running uphill and then your heart rate kind of shoots up and you're like, Oh no, I shouldn't be breathing this hard. Um, so I'd say uh, the biggest thing for me has just been like trying to really calm my breathing down um, and like know that it's okay that my heart rate is getting up um, mm-hmm. and just not, you know, not like panic. Um, and yeah, I think that's the biggest thing. Just like, you know, cause sometimes I even notice like my breathing rate is just like way too high. And then I just kind of, check myself and I'm like okay just calm down like just slow down your breathing yeah um and that actually helps a lot um and yeah I mean definitely like practicing form too is super helpful like if you can get out and do some hill repeats um you're just you're gonna get more efficient at running uphill Mm -hmm. which totally helps um so yeah I guess just again like practicing um But yeah, I'd say just trying to stay calm is probably like the biggest thing for me. That's a really good one. So when you train, do you often run with other people or do you tend to run more solo? Um, you know, I'm kind of more of a solo runner. Like I really, I do really value my time just like out there by myself. Um, yep. yeah, it's just, it's like really peaceful for me. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's kind of funny cause there are so many amazing runners in this little city that we live in. Um, And I definitely do get out there with, with other people and, you know, like people are going to the Grand Canyon a lot to run or down to Sedona. um, And we'll all try to like link up and run together. Um, But yeah, I'd I'd say like in flag. Yeah. I'm mostly, mostly kind of out there by myself. Yeah, I, I'm pretty much the same way. If I'm in a new place, sure. Yeah, running with new people, that's awesome. But when I'm home, I really, yeah. that's kind of my time, personally. Like, Yep. <laughs> yeah, I feel the same way. Yeah. So what does training look like? So you're probably in kind of a base season right now, I'd guess? Yeah, yeah. So um, what's a week look like? So a week right now is kind of, you know, it's, it's been kind of hard with traveling because I've been all over the place, but ideally, um, I'd, you know, I, I'm trying to, I doubled a lot in college, um, doing like morning and afternoon runs. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to kind of limit that and just stick to longer runs. Um, and so yeah, pretty much anywhere from, I don't know, like an hour to 90 minutes a day. And then the weekends are longer, um, up around like two to three hours usually. Um, and yeah, I'm not really doing too many workouts right now, but like those are definitely kind of key for me. I mm-hmm. think just cause I do have that background of running faster. So I want to be able to like hold on to that. Mm-hmm. Um, cause I do think it can still benefit me out on the trails, but yeah, nothing like I'm I try not to be too crazy with like scheduling and stuff just because, you know, I do work pretty much full time too. So mm-hmm. it's kind of, you know, it's I don't want to like 
be too crazy about it. And then if something gets in my way, like freak out. <laughs> um, yeah, totally. So, yeah, kind of just going with the flow, but really just trying to, you know, build up my volume, um, stay healthy, get in some workouts right now if I can. But I think things will get a little bit more regimented, like closer to the summer. Yeah. I think that's actually really interesting because I think a lot of people think of ultra running as like you're putting in two or three hours on the weekdays and like eight hours every day on the weekend. <laughs> when you're talking about, I'm like, that's yeah. reasonable volume. I could like, that's yeah, I could yeah. do that. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And I do, I definitely like, I spend a lot of time on the bike too. Okay. Um, just cause I know, you know, if I'm trying to run like upwards of a hundred miles a week, I'm probably going to get hurt. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I like to stick to like, I feel like around 80 is kind of my sweet spot. Um, Mm -hmm. And then, you know, several hours on the bike too, like per week, not per day. Um, (laughs) That's awesome. Do you ride outside, inside? What's your riding look like? Yeah. Over the summer, I definitely ride outside a lot. Um, There aren't, there isn't a whole lot of cycling around here in terms of like road availability and stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, But we've got some good rides that I'll do. And then we, you know, um, I live with my boyfriend and we have just a little trainer in our apartment. So I'll hop on that a lot in the winter. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The trainer makes it super convenient to, uh, you know, catch up on your Netflix shows and whatnot while you <laughs> get in the quick workout. Totally. Your, your podcast binging. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and what about, uh, what about any like strength training, yoga, anything like that? Yeah, um, so we've got a little group in town of, you know, ultra and road and track runners who meet um, once a week and lift. Um, That's and awesome. Then I, also, I love that. Yeah, it's fun. It's it's like a funny little group of people, um, but it's cool because, you know, unless it, we've got something going on, pretty much everyone shows up every Wednesday. Um, and then, yeah, I do. I try to go to yoga actually a couple times a week. Um it's I think it's really good for like your core strength and it also I think has helped keep me healthy mm-hmm. um so yeah I'd say yoga and some lifting is definitely also key for me yeah for sure when you guys okay now I have to know what this group is doing what do you guys lift what are some <laughs> of the like major moves you do <laughs> yeah it's it's pretty cool so we go to this place um called hypo t sport and, you know, they're kind of an all around, like, uh, I guess, I don't even, I don't even know what I would call it, but like if, uh, if athletes come to Flagstaff from other countries and stuff or like training camps, um, Hypo 2 is kind of like the place to go to get everything set up. Um, they've got like massage therapists and, uh, strength trainers and all sorts of good stuff. Um, so yeah, we've got a strength trainer there who meets with us once a week and it's pretty cool. Like the, you can tell he's, it's pretty personal. So like for the ultra runners, you know, we're doing a lot of like hip strength and glute strength, um, and like more lower body stuff and like stability. Um, and then the road and track people are, you know, doing that too, but like maybe some more upper body stuff and like heavier lifting um and you know more of that like fast twitch kind of stuff Mm -hmm. so yeah it's a lot of a lot of like core strength definitely um and a lot of glute strength I would say yeah now with the core strength have you found I mean compared to I guess even running on the track on the trail I feel like core really really matters yeah definitely um yeah I've gotten you know, a couple little flare ups out here. Um, once, like since I've started running on the trails and I think it is just like a lack of being able to use my whole body when I'm running. Um, mm-hmm. cause that's definitely kind of key on the trails. Like, you know, when you're having to, you're, you're just moving in such different ways than you're used to having raced on a track. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, I think just being strong, like, everywhere is really important because you never know like what part of your body you're going to have to use. Yeah. Um, And you also, I feel like don't really realize it when you're running, like how much of your body you're actually using. Yeah. Um, For sure. So, yeah. 
Yeah, and then I want to talk about fueling a little bit. So, I mean, A, it seems like you're working out a fair bit during, like, any normal day. So I want to know what, like, a normal day of eating looks like for you, but I also want to know what you're eating on those long runs. Yeah, so I, um, I've i actually been vegan for several months now. Um, oh, okay. So, yeah, so that's been pretty different for me, and I'm, like, trying to figure out, you know, exactly how to – like dial that in um but yeah I mean typically you know I'll wake up and have like kind of a little snack before I work out um whether it's like a banana and peanut butter toast or something um and then usually like a bigger meal after you know after a big workout or a longer run which I'll typically try to do in the morning if I can Mm -hmm. um and yeah, I feel like there's lots of, you know, a lot of fruits and vegetables. Um, and obviously like I'm kind of constantly consuming carbs. Um, but yeah. And then when I'm out on like longer runs, I'm, I'm a really big like gel person. Like I don't really like to bring like solid food. Mm-hmm. Um, I've been able to stomach gels pretty well. So I feel like they give you all the nutrition you need without like upsetting your stomach. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I'll bring, you know, if I bring a vest or something, I'll, I'll fill it with water. I sweat a ton. So I definitely <laughs> need, I need to like make sure that I have a lot of water with me. Mm-hmm. Um, but other than that, just, you know, a few gels. Um, and yeah, that's kind of all that I've been able to, you know, take in comfortably. Yeah. Okay, so this is super interesting because the last ultra runner I talked to, which was over a year ago now that I'm thinking about it, for this podcast was also vegan. Is there like an ultra running trend towards veganism? And then I know like there's Scott Jurek who is vegan. Brendan Brazer was another like pretty ultra athlete that is. Yeah. Um, you know, I'd say it's definitely more of an ultra runner thing than like a track thing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I, I can't say that for sure, but like just having been around a bunch of track athletes for most of my life and now being around more ultra runners, I've, I've met a lot more runners who are either vegetarian or vegan. Um, and you know, I think it really does kind of go back to that, like the grassroots thing of like you just start to think more about the environment and you're thinking more about like, yeah, I guess just what you are taking in. Um, And I think, you know, when you're on the track and doing shorter distances, it's really might be more important to keep up like that muscle mass and you're wanting a lot of protein. And I think there's this idea that you need to be eating meat to like, you know, keep that, keep that up and, yeah, I've, I've kind of started to realize that it's just, you know, I don't really need it. Mm -hmm. Um, and I don't really want it at this point. So Mm -hmm. yeah, but I'd say it is probably a little bit of a trend. Yeah. I mean, I noticed that in, I guess more like cyclocross, which was probably one of the most like grassroots cycling type things a decade ago. Cause that was, I was Mm -hmm. vegan back then and it seemed like everyone around me was too, which I thought was so interesting for that sport. Yeah. Um, have you found any, any like challenges with going vegan or has it been a pretty painless transition? Um, you know, it really has been pretty painless for me. Um, yeah, I like, I've, I've definitely just gotten way more into like learning about food and learning about like how to fuel. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, it's, it's been an interesting ride though. Like I think in college there's, you know, you're surrounded by a lot of people who have a lot of kind of like disordered eating. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's, yeah, it's a really difficult thing to figure out what actually works best for you. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, I mean, I was definitely affected in college just by being surrounded by people who seem to care more about, you know, staying really thin rather than actually fueling correctly. Um, and it's a really, yeah, it's a really hard thing to deal with when you're also trying to compete at a really high level. Yeah, um, absolutely. There's so, such a fine line, right? Oh my God, totally. And, you know, I'd say when you're, you know, when you're running faster races, it's almost more important to 
ride that line. Whereas I think when you're, um, when you're getting into longer stuff, like it's sometimes beneficial to maybe have a little extra weight. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's like, yeah, it's, it's a really hard thing to, to figure out. And I think, you know, I've benefited just from learning about nutrition rather than just being like, oh, well, if I'm skinny, I'll be fast. Yes. (laughs) Yeah. It's, um, it's hard. Yeah. I think that's so interesting. Just the idea of, you know, you went vegan and now you're actually kind of forced to learn about what's going to work because, you know, eating just like the, you know, vegan labeled everything. I remember realizing Oreos were vegan and that made up like a major (laughs) part of my food group for a while back in the day. Um, But realizing you actually need to focus on nutrition if you're going to do that. I think it's a great, like, force you to like learn about nutrition kind of thing. Yeah, totally. And no, I totally know what you mean. And like, it's, yeah, it's kind of interesting. I actually listened to this podcast recently that was pretty eye-opening that was basically saying that um you know veganism is it's becoming kind of a trend and like you see a lot more vegan options and stuff but it doesn't necessarily mean that this stuff is good for you oh my Um, god when i was i think when i was vegan i used to go to this vegan fast food place where they had vegan wings uh and vegan milkshakes and go like double milkshake double order of wings like it was bad <laughs> yeah totally they were totally. actually but, like, like it's easy to oh sorry go ahead <laughs> oh no i was just gonna say it's, it's super easy to you know see the word vegan and you're like oh that must be good for me exactly um, but yeah it's, i think it's kind of becoming like a dangerous thing because yeah there are so many more options now that like it's actually you know i think the whole re- reason that being vegan is more healthy is because it's just closer to earth and closer to like how food is naturally without Mm -hmm. being processed but now there's so much processed vegan food out there that you know you really do have to figure out why what you're eating is actually good for you or not good for you yes i love that okay yeah what are your what are your key races this season what are your goals Oh man. Okay. Let's see. I'm going to uh, bring up my schedule here. Cause I've got a, I've got a lot of them on my mind. Nice. Um, so, all right. I'm running. So the Chuck Nut 50 K is the first one I'm doing, um, which is at the end of March. Um, and that's just going to be kind of a get back in the mindset of racing type race. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, my training hasn't been perfect by any means. So just kind of, you know, I guess, whip myself back into shape with that one. Yep, yep. <laughs> um, and then I'm doing the Lake Sonoma 50 miler in April. Um, so yeah, that'll be, I think that'll be fun. It's going to be my first, like, you know, more competitive and longer ultra. So that, yeah, that'll be a good one. Um, I know a couple, couple people who are going to be there, so that'll be fun. Um, and then let's see closer to like you know midsummer um so under armor actually has put on this really awesome trail series um they started it last year and this will be the second year they're doing it so i'll be at all three of those oh cool one of them one yeah uh that's like the mountain run series right yep yeah so one of them actually is in colorado um, which will be nice. It's pretty close to me. And then there's one out in Killington, Vermont, which will also be cool because it's close to my hometown. Um, and then there's one at Mount Bachelor in Oregon. So, yeah, I'll be at all three of those. I'm not sure which one's exactly I'm going to race yet, um, but I'll probably race two of them and nice. kind of go out just to support the third. But, yeah, and then, you know, I think – at the end of the year, I'll try to find, like, a pretty big goal race, whether it's um, the North Face out in San Francisco or I'm also pretty into the uh, JFK 50 miler because it's, mm-hmm. like, close to where I ran in college. So, yeah, we'll kind of see, you know, how the year goes, but those are kind of the things that are on my list. 
That's awesome. I'm really hoping I can actually make it to the Killington one or the one in Oregon. I'm not really sure what our schedule looks like yet, but I have my fingers crossed. Nice. I want to do one of yeah, those so they, bad. Totally. They're, they're awesome spots and, you know, a really, really cool company that's putting them on. So, mm-hmm. yeah, they should be fun. And it's cool because they have, like, so many different uh, distances. Like, mm-hmm. I feel like you can race anything from, you know, like a vertical kilometer up to like 50k so it's pretty cool yeah for sure okay last thing what piece of advice would you give someone new like what's like one thing you wish someone had told you before your first race oh man um let's see uh you know i i really like i reached out to a lot of people and asked a lot of questions um so i feel like i got some pretty good the biggest most important piece did get and did use was to fuel make sure you're fueling correctly mm-hmm. um so i you know i'm sure i'll figure this out over the years what actually works best for me but you know so like most people were like yeah you should be fueling every 30 minutes mm-hmm. um like from from the start so you know don't wait because you know i would go on like two hour runs in college and not have an ounce of nutrition, which to me now is just like stupid. Um, (laughs) So yeah, like I feel like I was going into it with a mindset of like, Oh, you don't need to be like consuming that many calories. Um, But you really do. And it's really helpful to do it from the start. So like, don't, don't go into it being like, Oh yeah, I'll just not eat anything for, 90 minutes and then start fueling because at that point it's going to be too late um so yeah fuel early and fuel often is what i would say i love that advice i think that's so important and yeah i was the exact same with like oh yeah like two hours uh, you're you're fine for two hours and yeah just like oh the worst time to cut calories is during your workout (laughs) it makes no sense yeah like you're literally burning them why are you trying to cut them yeah, and I think, you know, that goes along, too, with, like, you know, the, this weird this weird dynamic of running and eating that's mm-hmm. really kind of difficult for everyone to figure out. But, yeah, if there's a time that you are going to, like, consume more, it should be when you're trying to get, like, the absolute most out of your body. Exactly. Um, so, yeah, definitely definitely don't try to cut back on that during a race. <laughs> yes. Oh, my gosh. Absolutely. Okay, last thing. Where can everyone find you on the interwebs? On the interwebs. Well, let's see. I don't really use Twitter, um, but you can find me on Instagram at uh, it's, it's Sarah Cotton. So I T S and then my name, Sarah Cotton. Um, and then my company website is it's called Rabbit Wolf Creative. So it's just rabbitwolfcreative.com. Um, and yeah, those are probably the, the main two to look for me on. Perfect. And we'll put those both in the show notes. Awesome. awesome. Well, I'm so glad we got to have this chat. Um, I'm so glad we got connected through Under Armour and Matt Myron. It was awesome. Me too. Chatting. And yeah, <laughs> hopefully we'll see you this summer in either Killington or at the Oregon one. That would be rad. Yeah, that would be awesome. Let me know if you're going to be at either of those for Will sure. Will do. Hey guys, before you go, we just wanted to have one quick word from our sponsor, Health IQ. Health IQ is a life insurance company that helps the consummate athlete like you save money on your life insurance. To find out more, you can check out healthiq.com slash C-A-P-O-D. That's C-A-P-O-D for all the details and to take a free quiz. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of the Consummate Athlete Podcast. To check out all of the show notes for this show, go to consummateathlete.com. And to follow along with our various adventures on the social medias, you can check us out on Facebook at facebook.com slash consummateathlete or follow me, Molly Herford, at Molly J. Herford on Twitter and Instagram. And I'm at Peter Glassford on Twitter and Instagram. And if you could give us a huge favor and rate and review the podcast over on iTunes, that helps us bring on more guests, you know, get more episodes out and do more cool stuff. So we would be forever grateful. And if you're looking for coaching for endurance sport or just for health and wellness, uh, you can check out smartathlete.ca. And for amazing outdoor content, 
you can check out theoutdooredit.com. Aw, honey. And that's theoutdooredit.com for Molly Herford's writing and all things outdoors. All right. Thank you so much for listening, guys, and we'll see you next time.